And as I'm watching service, the flow of service, you guys may be asking the same question as I was asking, what else can go wrong today? <laughs> but I know there's one thing that is absolutely true, and there's one thing that is perfect that can never go wrong, and that is the Word of God. And that's to what we come to today. We come to the Word of God. And as we were preparing and choosing a topic, what we're going to begin for, um, for English services, we decided to choose Psalm 119 because Psalm 119 is all about the Word of God. And every eight verses are broken up, and they speak about a different subject on the Word of God. Uh, if I can uh, get the next slide, you guys can see that there's 22 stanzas in Psalm 119. Each one of them are eight verses each, and each, each eight verses begin with uh, the Hebrew alphabet. So the first one is Aleph, and as you can see, if you're trying to figure out how to read it, they read it from right to left, not from left to right. So as you can see, the, the Aleph, the one on the very right, is the same word. So whoever wrote Psalm 119 was pretty literate. Um, he was able to start every single sentence with the word A. And then so the next, eight section, the next eight verses, 9 to 16, will start with the letter B, or Beth. And so it continues. And it culminates in the very last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which I do not know. Stay tuned and you'll see what it is in about a year. So um, <laughs> Psalm 119, verses 1 through 8. And so as we, as we look at Psalm 119, it celebrates the Torah, the Old Testament writing, the instruction that God has left for his people. Um, it is actually pictured as the perfect guide for our life. And the goal of this whole chapter, you can even make it a book because it has so many verses, but the goal of this whole chapter is to help God's people admire his word and that this word may shape, may shape their character and their conduct. The instructions that are written in this chapter are righteous, true, and sure. And what's interesting about Psalm 119 is that not only does God show us his love through Jesus Christ, but he also gives us a way to live out our Christian life here. He gives us a perfect guide to our life. There's many guidebooks we may have used or, or many moments where we've tried to use Google Maps on our iPhones and they have directed us to the wrong place and we show up and we're like, no, this is not where I want to be. I had that a few times. You show up and it's actually um, the wrong side of the street. You're supposed to make a huge circle and come back, but it's the same address. And the Word of God, it does not do that. It constantly directs us into the right place. And as we look at this, at these, at this chapter, there are, eight, there are seven words uh, that are synonymous with the Word of God. Seven words. And the seven words that we will see in English are law, testimonies, precepts, statutes, commandments, rules, and word. And they are all synonymous to the Word of God, but they have different meanings, such as the one for law means instruction. Testimonies means what God solemnly testifies. Precepts, what God has appointed to be done. Commandments, what God commanded. Rules, what the divine judge has ruled to be right. And we see that these seven words that are synonymous with the word um, actually have a different meaning. So every single verse that we're going to look at actually has a certain um, different picture to it. It's not just the word, but it could be the statutes, what the divine lawgiver has laid down, or something else, which is uh, uh, God's will for us in our life. And so before we actually jump into Psalm 119, I want to begin by saying that I, the, the topic of the sermon is the blessed word. That's what we're going to look at today, the blessed word. But as I was looking at Psalm 19 verses 1 through 8, and as I look at your faces now, which are so solo and uh, tired, I hopefully by the end of this time we'll be able to put smiles on our faces as we go through these eight verses. I noticed... I notice a concept or a misconception among uh, the people in society today, which has also crept into the church, and it's in the misunderstanding of the word. And I want to look at three ways that we may misunderstand the word, which doesn't produce the effects on the lives that God would want, us, would want it to produce. And the first one is something that we encounter often. The Bible is boring and mundane. How many of you guys are affected by that, at least once throughout your Christian life? The Bible is boring, boring and mundane. You open it. And all you see, David David's acknowledges that. Uh, as you open it, you see just black words on white paper. The second one is the Bible is a set of rules to live by. And I don't really want to live by that set of rules. I want to live my own life. I want to do things the way I want to do it. 
And the second misconception is that the Bible gives us just rules to live by, and I can't really do what I want. I don't have my own will. I can't do, make the choices that I want to make. And, that, and that's why I kind of like lay aside from the word and don't read it. That's the second misunderstanding, I believe. And the third one is that what we see a lot in media and politics is that the Bible is just another book. It's just another opinion that I can add to my list or my booklet of opinions. And to be honest, this mentality is not only seen in society today, but it has slowly crept into the church where the Bible is seen as boring and mundane. It is seen kind of like a set of rules. I don't really want to follow this. And sometimes it just becomes an opinion that we can use to prove our point. But hopefully by the end of these eight verses, we'll be able to see that this is not true, that the Bible is authoritative, that the Bible is beautiful, that the Bible is blessed and it makes us happy. I want us to walk away today think, seeing that the Bible is not misunderstood, but the Bible is majestic. And so, as we read these verses, we will see ways that keeping the Word and living and abiding in it will bless us. You know, there's many paths that we take in our life, but there are only certain paths that bring us blessedness, that bring us happiness. And so this is a starting point. Psalm 119 it's like Psalm 1, it begins with the same word, blessed. It's a starting point in our life which directs the rest of our life. And if you get the starting point correct, then the rest of your life will be guided and it will be beautiful. And that's what this psalmist wants to tell us today, that listen to the word of God. It is the guide for your life. It is beautiful. It will lead you in those places that make you happy. It will direct your life. And it will be abundant blessing to you. And so... I want to hike through the Alps, as some of my favorite preachers say, by digging into the Word. So let's read the first eight verses together, Psalm 119, 1 through 8. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep His testimonies, who seek Him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong, but walk in His ways. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. I'll praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous rules. I will keep your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this evening, and as we come to your word, Lord, as we look at this guide for our life, Father, that we may see that it is beautiful, that it is a blessed thing that you have given us your word, the very word which you have spoken, and today we do not need to go anywhere, Lord, to receive instruction for our life, but you have given us to us in your word, in this psalm. Open our eyes that we may see your truths. Amen. As we look at Psalm 119, what's the first word that you guys see? Blessed. Blessed is the very first word that the psalmist writes. It's the same word that's used in Psalm 1 that we read today. Blessed a man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. You know this thing? It's a, it's a word of interjection. It's a, it's a word that, that you say um, that expresses emotion at something so sudden. So if you receive a wonderful birthday present, you're very happy. And you're like, thank you, thank you so much. I really enjoy this. You're happy. And if you receive a not-so-great birthday present, the look on your face gives it all away. So it's an expression that automatically comes, comes off. Um, and it's the same word that Jesus begins the Sermon on the Mount, the very same word that Jesus begins the Sermon on the Mount, the very first word that Jesus ever speaks. He says, you're blessed. You're happy. And Psalm 144 uses this word interchangeably with happiness, blessed. Happy are the people who are in such a state. Happy are the people whose God is the Lord. In the New Testament, the same word is used in James 125. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer but who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed. This man will be happy if he does what the Word of God says. 
And I look at this word blessed and I ask, why is it important to me in my life? Why is happiness important to me in my life? And I believe that happiness is important because we all seek happiness in our life. The career paths that we choose, the jobs that we want to work at, the relationships that we get into, the very simple, simple small things of our life that we choose to do, we do it to receive happiness. And I'll read a quote with you that's going to come up on the screen by Blaise Pascal. And this, is what is, this is what he says. All men seek happiness. This is without exception. Whatever different means they employ, they all tend to this end. The cause of some going to war and of others avoiding it is the same desire in both, attended with different views. They will never take the least step but to this object. This is the motive of every action of every man, even of those who hang themselves. Blaise Pascal says that everybody seeks happiness, everybody seeks joy in our life, in their life, and even those people who hang themselves. Their life is so miserable that they're seeking joy in some other life outside of this one. And I thought, you know what? The psalm, talking about happiness, talking about blessedness, wants us to live this kind of lifestyle. The Bible, the scripture wants us to be happy and to be blessed. And we seek it in so many things in our life. And, you know, I never thought that seeking happiness in my life or seeking joy, I would end up back at the word of God. <laughs> no one ever thought that they'd be seeking happiness in this world and satisfaction. And then one day God would open their eyes and they see that happiness is in the word. And I was, I was preparing for this, and it just shocked me. I, cut, I come back to the Word constantly because there's nothing in this world that can give me the happiness and joy that the Word of God gives. There's nothing in this world that can provide that kind of happiness. And so, blessed are those whose way is blameless. These people are happy. These people are in the Word. So, the first view that we saw, the Bible is boring and mundane, is contradicted because here the Word of God says, no, happiness is found in the word. The first point that we will look at is the path of the blessed. And you guys have already seen it. The path of the blessed, and we'll continue to look at uh, other parts of our life, other walks of our life, which bring us blessedness. So the first thing, let's look at verse 1. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. It's the way, it's a course of life that this person is taking. It's a journey that we're taking. Remember, it, the very first step of your life will direct the rest of your life. It depends where you are going. And so the way, the course of this life of this man here or these people here is that their way is blameless. It's, cu it's pure, it's undefiled, it's wholesome. And you may ask, is this possible to walk in a way which is blameless? And you may ask yourself, why do I stumble so constantly? And the reason is because the word of God is not in your life. Psalm 119, this Psalm verse 105 says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. This verse struck me four years ago as I was sitting there trying to figure out why can I not walk purely before God? Why do I constantly stumble and I constantly struggle in my life? And it's because the word of God was not there. It was not that lamp to my feet and that light to my path that directed me in the right direction. My path was not illumined. And the moment that I realized that, the moment you come back to the word and realize that it is the light, it illumines the way that you go, you will not stumble. And so I started sending out verses, and I was a Jesus freak, according to friends in school. And they checked my Facebook and like, dude, you're all about Jesus. I'm like, yeah, man, it's hard not to be. <laughs> so um, what happened is I started sending out verses. How many of you guys had those verses? You guys got them. Some of you guys were like, Open them every day like, man, I'm tired of this. But I still sent them because I knew that the word of God would be the light to your path for that day, that it would direct you and it would give you strength. And we must understand that, that to be blameless, we need the word of God. And what do these people do? They walk in the law of the, of the Lord. And this is the first synonym that we see with, with the word of God. It's called law. Um, and it means instruction. Um, it just means instruction. There are certain instructions that we hear in our life. When you're married and you're a wife, you hear the instruction, go make me a sandwich. Uh, I kind of hear that often, so I had to bring it in. Or the instruction that you're with from your parents, go take out the garbage, wash the dishes, clean your room, 
and clean your closet. How many of you guys hear that like every single week? And if you don't live with your parents, they call you. Did you clean your room? No. <laughs> These, this is an instruction that is given. And what happened when we disobeyed to the instruction of our parents? Were we blessed, <laughs> as verse 1 says? No, we weren't. We're not blessed. But blessed are those who are blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord, who walk in the instruction of the Lord. So first of all, the Bible is the, the, is the path of the blessed. In other words, loving or delighting in what we know of God in Scripture will be the key that opens Scripture further. That's John Piper. In other words, loving or delighting in what we know of God in Scripture will be the key that opens Scripture further. And that's what verses 1 is talking about. Who walk in the law of the Lord. When we walk in the law of the Lord, as we see who God is, and as we get to know Him, then that instruction makes us want to know God better. Second thing, the product of the blessed. The product of the blessed. First, we have the path of the blessed. Second is the product of the blessed. The product of those people who are happy in God. In verse 2, there's, there's two things that we're called to. Blessed are those who keep His testimonies, one, and who seek Him with their whole heart. Keeping something. When, it, where is it, when was the time that you guys treasured something in your life that you hid it? It could have been some birthday money. It could have been a note that you got from one of your friends or one of your better friends. Um, it, could, it could have been something that was of value to you, and you treasured it, and you hid it. And that is what this verse is talking about. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies. And here's the second word we see that's synonymous with the word. And it means what God solemnly testifies to be his will. So what God says to be his will. And so blessed are those who keep the will of God, we can say. And if you may ask, how, how can I be blessed? The blessed don't just sit around and one morning we wake up and we read the Bible and all of a sudden we're blessed and we're happy in God and that's it, our life is dandy. We can go stroll down the street and sing songs. Um, it, that's not how it happens. We have to do the will of God. We have to keep the will of God. And the second thing is we seek. Um, who seek him with their whole heart. It's not a, with a part of our heart that we see God. We seek God with our whole heart. And as we look at this, we come to verse 3, which says, Who also do no wrong but walk in his ways. That's the product of the blessed. You want to be blessed in your life? You keep the word of God. And what it does, it brings you no wrong. Why does it bring you no wrong? Because the path of this people in, verses, in verse 2 is a path that is set. The pathway is set out for this people. It is straight. They walk and they keep the testimonies of God. And because of that, they do no wrong. Because they walk in the word of God, they do no wrong. How many times have we done things that are wrong and we wonder why we have done these wrong things? We struggle with ourselves and we beat ourselves up. Why is our heart wanting this? Why is our mind thinking of this? How can I get rid of this? Why am I constantly doing wrong? Why am I constantly in the wrong? And it's because we're not seeking and not keeping the testimonies of God. We're not seeking the will of God. Luther says the Bible is a remarkable fountain. The more one draws and drinks of it, the more it stimulates thirst. The more we seek God, the more we draw to God, the more it stimulates thirst. It brings us thirst. And again, these people not only do no wrong, but why do they not do wrong? Blessed are they, right? So these people are happy. These people are happy. They don't need to go to sin to receive happiness. John Piper says this, Holiness is a fancy word for someone who is so happy in God, sin has no appeal anymore. Holiness is a fancy word for someone. It's a fancy word, like holiness. Uh, what's holiness? Everyone's like, I don't know. Piper says, here it goes. It's a fancy word for someone who is so happy in God, sin has no appeal anymore. We look at sin and we say, I don't, want it. I don't want that anymore. Because I'm happy, I'm blessed, and they do no wrong, but walk in his ways. And what are the wills of God so we can keep his testimonies? We know what they are. To be sanctified, to be spirit-filled, to be saved. As we look at verse 4, the third thing that we see is the pursuit of the blessed. The path of the blessed, the product of the blessed... They're, they do no wrong, and then the pursuit of the blessed. And here is where the psalmist turns his attention to God. The psalmist is seeking these things, his way is blameless, he's walking in the law of the Lord, 
but his attention is turned to God in verse 4. And he says this, you have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. He says, Lord, you have told us to keep your precepts. I cannot do it on my own. All these three verses cannot be done without the grace of God, the sustain, sustaining grace of God. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. The psalmist is sitting down, he's pausing, and he's saying, Lord, you have told me to do this. I will look up to you for the strength that you provide. Lord, help us is our daily cry. Being dependent on God is what we need every single day. And then, and only then, will we do no wrong and not be, and be blameless. In verse 5, we continue and see the pursuit of the blessed. He cries out, and this should be the cry of all of us, as the psalmist writes, Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes, that my ways may be firm, that my, way, my ways may be established and stable. And if, if we're looking again at the analogy of Psalm 119 and taking our first steps in our life and we're on this path and we're on this hike, as we can say, it's very important that our ways are steadfast and are firm and are stable, right? We don't walk on the edge of the Grand Canyon or walk in, on a hike to Half Dome and we just jog along and aren't steadfast and we see a loose rock. Sure, I'll step on that. Nobody says that because <laughs> you'll be gone. And the same way the psalmist is saying, my ways, oh, that my ways may be steadfast. Oh, that my ways may be strong, that I may walk and keep your statutes. Many times I think about in which way am I steadfast, am I firm, am I established? And I answer it myself, to myself, usually in the latest fashion trend, usually in the new TV series, usually in the iPhone 5, which is coming out Wednesday. All right, who's going to buy it? We're usually established in way in things that aren't important. We're established in the, we know all the cars, we know the latest fashion trend, we always wear scarves or whatever it may be. You know, we drive, <laughs> all right. And we, we, are, we stand firm in things that are not, are not that important. And what does the psalmist say? Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in what? In keeping your statutes. And it's not the statues that you see in a museum or parks. These aren't the same statutes. The statutes here, synonymous with the word of God, means boundaries or limits. Boundaries or limits. And this is very important. Oh, that my way may be steadfast in keeping your limits and keeping your boundaries and walking. If I'm going to be walking on a path and if I'm going to be walking on a trail, I want to make sure that I stay in those boundaries because the moment I step off those boundaries, you never know where you're going to end up. And this is what the psalmist is saying. Stay in those boundaries. Make your feet firm in the word of God and keeping his statutes and keeping his limits. And we all have stories when we've stepped outside of the limits of God, out of God's boundaries when we're walking in his will, and then all of a sudden we decide to step out and we reap the consequences of that in our life. We reap the consequences of sin. It could be the day after, the morning after, the same night, whenever time it is. We wake up and we say, what have I done? I've sinned against God, and we reap the consequences because you have stepped outside of the limits of God stepped outside of the boundaries that God has set up for you. And the word of God is what prevents that. And this is the pursuit of those people who are blessed. They pursue the ways of God. They keep the boundaries of God because it's what makes them happy. It's what brings blessings in their life like nothing else can. In verse 6, we know the psalmist stepped out of the boundaries. Read together. Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. What happened to the psalmist? He stepped out of the boundaries, and he experienced shame. And he says here in verse 6, then I won't be put to shame. If I keep your statutes, I won't be put to shame. I won't have to worry about the consequences of sin. The word of God prevents that. He doesn't taste shame anymore in his life. 
And how does he do this? He's firm in his steps, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. Having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. It's not that one time we read the Bible once a week, we throw in that piece of bread, and we think it's going to sustain us for the whole week. Who's ever tried doing that in their life? Trying to go on a certain diet, a green, mean, juice diet, and it not working out. And you are tired by the third and fourth day. This guy has. And it wasn't a great idea, to be honest. I needed the protein, and I wasn't getting it. And what happened is that I, my eyes, I wasn't filling myself. In the same way here, the psalmist's eyes are fixed on the commandments of God. They're steadfast. It's not that one time he just, he just ate the word of God and it sustained him for a whole month. Again, this comes back to the point that we need God and Jesus every single day of our life. Otherwise, we'll go outside of the boundaries and we'll be put to shame. Our eyes must be fixed. Dwight L. Moody said these words. The Bible will keep you from sin or, finish it off, sin will keep you from the Bible. The Bible will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from the Bible. If we are in the Word of God, if our eyes are fixed on the commandments of God, and here's another um, word that's synonymous with the Scripture, which is commandments, it means what God has commanded for us to do, then we will not be put to shame. We will stay in the boundaries of God and we will be blessed. And that's the appeal of the psalmist in verse 5, that his ways may be steadfast. And his gaze is not moving. As you can see here, it's fixed. His eyes are fixed on something. You know, us guys, we glance a lot. It's better not to glance. It's better to have your eyes fixed on the word instead of glancing at other things. And it goes the same for everybody else. And so the second thing is, the second misconception that we saw was that the word of God is just a set of rules. And if today you think the word of God is a set of rules, it's not. Because it is a way that directs you from shame into blessedness. You may think that the word of God is binding you to something and that I want to live on my own, but what it's doing is preventing you from sinning. It's keeping you clean. And it's keeping you praising God. It's leading you into blessedness. And as we see in verse 7, the reaction of the blessed is praise. The praise of the blessed. The path of the blessed, the product of the blessed, the pursuit of the blessed, and the praise of the blessed. And let's read those verses. I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous rules. I will keep your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous rules. This man is writing these verses has experienced the blessedness of God. He has experienced walking with God in the path that God has provided for him, and he's not going off that path. And what happens is that his heart is upright, and he is bringing true praise to God. And many times I ask myself this question, why can't I worship God fully? Why is it when I stand at church or when we go to youth services, all I see is white words on a black screen? Why am I not experiencing the words that we see, the lyrics, the truth of God? And the reason why you see white words on a black screen is because at home, when you open the scripture, you see black words on a white page. It's because you're not experiencing God, and the first six verses of the chapter are not working in your life, and God is not directing you, and you're not pursuing the path of the blessed. And so you cannot be praising God with an upright heart. It's not possible. If today... You're thinking, how can I praise God? You have to come back to the word of God. You have to listen to the word of God. You have to walk in the word of God. And then you'll be able to praise. One way that we can easily check ourselves if we're walking with God is that we will automatically be praising God. That's the way that we can check our life. If we are praising God automatically, if we pray to God, if we come to church services and our, the words roll off of our tongue because... We're walking with God. We're so close with God. We're communing with God so closely that you're experiencing this blessedness and this praise is just an overflow of what's going on in your heart. Did you know that? The praise is overflow of what's going on in your heart. And when will this happen? When I learn your righteous rules. 
It is what the divine judge has ruled to be right. That is what rules are. And you can ask yourself, why is this a process? He uses the word learn. When I learn your righteous rules, and the reason being is that we do not want to submit to what the divine judge has already told us to do, or what the rules that he has set up for us, because we want to rule our own life. When I learn your righteous rules, you know, learning to walk in the will of God and learning to trust God is a process. Learning is a process. And learning the righteous rules of God is a process. It's a process of humility where we exercise and we train to understand the rules of God and then we submit to the rules of God because we see that it is the best thing for us. And so the third view is that the Bible is another opinion, but it's not. The Bible is absolutely right. God's rules are absolutely perfect. And there is no debating because God is the one who is sovereign and not us. And in verse 8, we see the conclusion of this stanza. writes, I will keep your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. He comes back to relying on God's sustaining grace. As in verse 4, it began on relying on God's grace. In verse 8, it ends on relying with God's grace. I'll keep your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. He doesn't want to be forsaken by God. He's crying out to God, I will do what I can. Do not leave with your presence. Be near to me. Do not forsake me, Lord, because if you do, I'm not going to be able to do this on my own. I'm not going to be able to do this on my own. I open the Bible and I see black words on white pages. Therefore, your, your first duty is to begin to pray and to pray to this effect that if it please God to accomplish something for his glory, not for yours or any other person's, he may very graciously grant you a true understanding of his words. That's what Luther said. He experienced the word of God in such a way that it transformed his whole life. And he came to the word and that's what changed him. Nothing else changed him. And so the word of God is the blessed word. It is the word that God wants us to walk in. It's the word from which we reap happiness. It's the word that we enjoy when we open it. And after we read a few chapters, our heart is rejoicing. Our heart has a smiley face. That's what happens when we open the word of God. And I pray that today that the mundane word, the misunderstood word may become the majestic word to you. And if it's not like that for you today, then pray to God that he opens your eyes because this is the only thing that will ever change your life. I got 26 likes on Facebook from a post about this passage, and I want to share it with you. It's like a lot of likes. <laughs> and I prayed, and then the Holy Spirit told me to write it, and I wrote it, and... Uh, our relationships, our relationship with the word will be a representation or direct us in our relationship with our family, friends, and foes. Our relationship with the word of God will reflect in our relationship with everybody else. And this is another way where we can check ourselves. Is our relationship with our peers, with our family, are they good? Are they in a good standing? Because if they're not, then your relationship in the word is lacking. That's what the issue is. And God wants us to come back to the word because the word of God is the only power that's able to change our hearts. Nothing else is able to change our hearts. And as you remember, Peter, he said these words, and maybe you guys may be thinking the same thing when Jesus asked him, do you want to leave me, Peter, because you're going through all these troubles for me? Maybe today you may be asking the question, why? Why should I start reading the Bible? And my parents just make me do it. I just do it just because they asked me to. I don't do it for myself. Understand this. There'll come a time when you will say with Peter, where shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And God does have the words of eternal life. And we will not be able to live apart from the word of God. As Matthew 4, 4 says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. 
We live, we thrive only by the words written in this book. If anyone ever wrote something great, it was never great as the word of God because God's the one who made us. God's the one who structured us. And so he knows what's best for us. And he wrote for us a guide for our life telling us, follow this because you will be happy. Don't follow your ways because your ways will lead you into sin. Your, la- your ways will lead you into shame. Follow the word and you will be happy. And that's what this call is in these first eight verses, is that we may walk in the word of God, that we may experience the blessings, whether we're on the path of the blessed, the product of the blessed, we're pursuing the word of God like the blessed do, and we're praising like the blessed. And just very two simple principles that if you forgot everything else I said, you must remember. Two simple principles. One is how to pray. Another one is just a principle how to read the Bible. The first one is how to pray. And I learned this from a, a great preacher. It's called the I-O-U-S prayer, I-O-U-S, I-O-U-S. And it's a prayer of the Psalms. And I stands for incline my heart to your testimonies. Incline my heart because my heart might, not, might be inclined to other things in my life at this moment. Incline my heart to your testimonies. O is open my eyes to see the wondrous things from your law. The word is wonderful. Help me see it. You is unite my heart to fear your name. Our heart is not united to fear God. If we walk in the fear of God and we walk fearing God and fearing to sin against him, we must pray to unite our heart. And the last thing is satisfy us this morning with your steadfast love. God wants our hearts to be satisfied in him. And as we come to the word, if we pray that, to incline our hearts, to open our eyes, to unite our hearts, to satisfy our hearts, he will do so. And if you're seeing black words on white pages, pray that prayer. Pray that prayer to God and he will open your eyes and you'll be reading this word and you're not going to want to go away from it. And like Jeremiah says, he says that I saw your words and I ate them and they became a delight to my heart. They became the joy of my heart. There's nothing else that I needed. And the second principle is no Bible, no breakfast. No Bible, no breakfast. It's a very easy principle to live by. And if you can do Bible and breakfast at the same time, that's great. But I like my food a lot, so <laughs> I, I take it one, time, one, one thing at a time. So no Bible, no breakfast. Live by that, and you will be experiencing the path of the blessed. And that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to experience this. And so hopefully today, the misunderstood word became the majestic word, and we're pursuing the path of the blessed and experiencing the product of the blessed, and we're praising like the blessed. Let's pray.